to say in the last month, video games have been really stepping it up with those at-home activities to replace all the time we gamers can't be spending outside. Stuff like FNM at home and Halo Double XP during the outbreak are providing real alternatives for all those spring break activities that us gamers are unfortunately missing out on this year. Companies like Ubisoft giving away free games, it's really awesome. It's acting as a consolation for me not being able to see my IRL friends, not being able to spend time in those big in-person groups in public places, not going to restaurants and instead having to order in all the time and have meals delivered to my door. Oh, thank you video game companies for giving me all these tools to help me through such a difficult, difficult time in my social life. Yeah, we're not fooling anyone, you guys. The rest of the world is eventually gonna figure out that we've been living like this for years. Just don't let on yet. Maybe we can get a couple more free games out of it. Internet. Welcome to Game Theory, the show that's helping you to escape from the cruel reality of a global pandemic by talking about an alternate reality that also had a global pandemic. Helpful map pad is helpful. Before today's episode, though, a brief PSA to remind you that staying at home is the single best way to protect yourself and the people around you from coronavirus. As of writing this episode, more than 2 million people worldwide have been diagnosed with COVID-19, which is twice as contagious as the flu and a hundred times more deadly. Unlike pandemics our grandparents may have seen, like measles, it's almost impossible to tell if you have COVID because there are no marks, there are no little red bumps, and many people have zero symptoms. Not just for days, but for weeks. You literally have no idea if you have it, and even less idea whether you can pass it on to someone else. I mean, we all feel bad about the fact that we can't go outside, that there's no E3 this year, that we can't even walk down a street without giving that COVID are you infected stare. A lot of us are out of a job, a lot of us are out of insurance, heck, even YouTubers at this point are seeing their ad rates plummeting. No joke, I'm really just making content to keep the channel functioning. Because I like you guys and because I want to have an excuse to continue paying our employees. This episode will honestly cost more to make than it will earn back in ad revenue. So if we all just want to get back to work, get back to our friends, or just get back to the mall, we need to wipe this out now by staying at home and supporting the people who are at risk. And when you do go out, make sure you wear a mask. I recently had a call with Andy Slavitt, the former head of Medicare and Medicaid during the Obama administration and he said that if 80% of people wore masks out in public, it would kill this thing in a matter of weeks. He also said that by staying at home, you are saving 41 lives. It's a matter of going out, unintentionally spreading it, and then those people going out and infecting others, and then a 1% fatality rate. So anyway, it is not every day that you can save an entire football team's worth of people by staying at home or wearing a facial mask, so just do it, guys. Alright, dark and stormy PSA over. It's also important to remember that it's okay to laugh. It's even okay to make fun of ourselves in this crazy craziness for a bit. And that's why today we're seeing how the video game world dealt with its own pandemic. Not to make light of anything happening in the world right now, but to talk about a pretty fascinating moment in gaming history and honestly an opportunity that humanity missed that would have allowed us to be more prepared for this exact type of situation. We didn't listen! Because here's the thing, World of Warcraft could have helped prevent COVID-19. Seriously, it's not a joke. It's barely even an exaggeration. It almost did prevent this massive pandemic, but humanity just dropped the ball on it. So strap in for a fascinating story, pay attention for the message so we don't make the same mistake again, and if nothing else, maybe this episode will inspire you to play something other than Animal Crossing for an hour. You're developing some uncomfortably close relationships with Tom Nook there, my friends. Don't think I don't see you. Besides trying to avoid the staggering lag notorious in major cities like Ironforge, vanilla World of Warcraft players wouldn't think that they would need to worry about social distancing. But believe it or not, back in 2005, there was absolutely a real pandemic in the World of Warcraft. One that looks scarily familiar to the situation that we currently find ourselves in today. This is the story of World of Warcraft's corrupted blood plague. Back in September of 2005, less than a year after the game first launched, WoW added the Zul'Gurub Raid, a 20-person team mission recommended for players around level 60, ending with a battle against a big
big boss named Hakkar the Soul Flare, who, besides having a Game of Thrones level awesome name, could inflict players with a debuff, the health effect called Corrupted Blood. Now, Corrupted Blood did a few things. It inflicted around 250 to 300 points of damage to your player every few seconds. Sounds pretty bad, right? But remember, this was a raid recommended for players around level 60, the level cap at the time, so your typical health pool was sitting around 4,000 to 5,000 HP. It would suck, sure, and you would have to maintain regular healing, but it wasn't going to kill you unless you were irresponsible. The debuff would eventually go away if you waited long enough, but the catch was that while you were standing around waiting for it to wear off, it was contagious. Standing next to an infected player could cause your character to become infected as well. Now, at this point, you're either thinking, why the heck would game devs make anything in-game contagious, or, wow, what a cool mechanic. The results of Corrupted Blood, though, are somewhere in the middle. The virus, this debuff, was only intended to exist within the confines of the ZG raid, so it would create a problem for the players in the middle of the fight as they figured out ways to manage their draining health and then also not transmitting it to their teammates while still dealing damage to the boss, but it would disappear once players exited the dungeon. All should have been functioning normally, right? Except the development team made one major oversight. Players weren't the only thing exiting the dungeon. Animals were leaving the area too, and the program didn't wipe it from them when they left. For those who don't know, in WoW, the hunter class is allowed to use a tamed pet in combat. Pets who are contracting corrupted blood during the battle just like the players, except unlike the players, the pet would still be infected when summoned again outside of the raid. And so what happens then? Well, the pet's owner immediately gets infected, except now that player is out of the dungeon and out in public. Just like COVID-19 is thought to have originated in bats, corrupted blood can also be classified as a zoonotic virus, a virus that originates in animals and then gets passed to humans. Out in public, anyone close to those infected players would themselves contract corrupted blood. Anyone the player is playing with, standing next to, fighting, literally anything. Corrupted blood was carried by the likes of a couple of hunters, cats, or dinosaurs, or crocolisks, moving from player to player until finally it even infected the game's NPCs. Now, it's important to note that the raid doling out this virus was accessible to both Alliance and Horde players, and it sat in one of the biggest neutral zones on the map. This meant that every player in every faction was at risk for infection. The NPCs ensured that the virus was carried across enemy lines, acting as asymptomatic carriers, having the debuff but not showing any outward signs of their infection, and obviously not complaining about it because they weren't real players. Standing in prominent places ready to interact with players, they were invisible vectors, spreading and re-spreading the virus across at least three servers and up to two million players. But what's the big deal, right? I mentioned earlier that this thing wasn't that big of a risk. It takes down health quickly, but not so quickly that it's an immediate death sentence. Except, those were high-level players in the raid that were intended to get infected. Sure, for a player at level 60, the max level cap for that time in the game's history, it was annoying. For a player at lower levels, though, levels 10, 20, heck, sometimes even at level 40, suddenly it becomes immediately deadly. Players might find themselves dead due to damage over time before they even realize what's happening. In another crazy parallel to the situation that we currently find ourselves in, the corrupted blood effect didn't impact all people equally. Like the exact scenario where now, healthy people with no issues might have no symptoms or just experience a day of feeling a little under the weather. Individuals with health compromises though, like the elderly, the very young, you know, people not currently at their max level, so to speak, they're suddenly struck out of nowhere, through no fault of their own, with something that could very easily be fatal. As for high-level players coming into contact with low-level players, this happened in WoW in the exact same places it happens in the real world. Major cities, places where all players were constantly visiting shops, doing business, socializing. Suddenly, they were hotbeds for the corrupted blood virus. It spread so quickly that it became almost impossible to avoid, driving players out of major cities in the game, just like the wealthy New Yorkers who packed their bags and headed out for the Hamptons to avoid the current pandemic. The corrupted blood plague spread quickest in densely populated areas, just like the current virus hit major cities in China, before jumping to other hotly touristed areas in Italy, the US, UK, and so on. Players who died in the game's major cities might not even be able to avoid getting it again when they respawn. They might not be able to get out and leave before their health pool depleted again. Meanwhile, slightly higher level players might have made it out of the cities, but then they only infected players in smaller towns. In one really touching parallel to our current situation, some WoW players acted as altruistic healers, trying to heal other players long enough for them to save off the effects of the plague. But then these would-be doctors placed themselves in danger of becoming infected, often catching the corrupted blood for themselves. Again, this strikes surprisingly close to home
home where people who work in the medical profession and come into direct contact with infected people are themselves one of the groups at greatest risk of infection. For days, the streets of World of Warcraft's biggest cities were strewn with skeletons, the remains of characters who had been wiped out by this plague. The disruption to gameplay was so serious that it caused WoW to gain attention outside of the game, with Reuters reporting on the situation in the game like this. Quote, Dealing with thousands of complaints from players whose online alter egos have fallen victim to the plague, Blizzard Entertainment tried to quarantine the infected zones, but as is likely in real life, the barriers were porous, and some infected victims managed to find their way into safe areas. In a matter of days, millions of player deaths were attributed to the corrupted blood, spread from just a few of the high-level players able to access that endgame raid. Blizzard eventually stepped in to fix the game and prevent the corrupted blood debuff from spreading outside the raid area, seemingly the only part of our story that differs from real life, because unfortunately fixing problems in the real world isn't as simple as just releasing a new patch or resetting a server. And thus ends the story of the Corrupted Blood Plague. But what's possibly even more fascinating than the event itself is the aftermath of the event in the real world. According to World of Warcraft producer Shane Dabiri, quote, We got calls from the CDC, the Center for Disease Control, saying, Hey, what's all this about the disease in your game? We want to look at the simulation data. It might help us in a real world situation. We kept saying, No, 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 it's just a bug. We fixed it. It's just a game. The Corrupted Blood incident may have been the result of a bug, but it continued to attract the attention of real-world researchers. In March 2007, Randy Balliser, an epidemiologist physician at the Ben-Gurion University in Israel, published an article in the journal Epidemiology that described the similarities between this game outbreak and the recent SARS and avian influenza outbreaks. According to him, role-playing games could serve as an advanced platform for modeling the dissemination of infectious diseases. In a follow-up article in the very highly regarded science journal, the game's second life was also suggested as another possible platform for these sorts of studies, and that's as far as it went. In August of 2007, Nina Pfefferman, a Tufts University assistant research professor of public health and family medicine, also noted the corrupted blood's resemblance with biological plagues. While she acknowledged that video game behavior in a virtual environment won't necessarily mirror real-world behavior, she compared the World of Warcraft incident to a drug trial with mice, saying this, It was a real good first step. These are my mice, and I want this to be my new experiment setup. End quote. Maybe the only time that gamers would be happy to be compared with lab mice. I'm all in. Just call me Mouse Pat. What's interesting about Nina Pfefferman's call for research is that she pointed out an important observation. A virus almost doesn't matter as much as the way the people treat it. What matters is the behavior of players, specifically how they evaluate risk, how rumors spread about a virus, and how public health notices would be handled and how people react to them. In fact, listening to what Nina Pfefferman had to say about corrupted blood and its applications to real world pandemics is almost prophetic in light of recent events. When it actually happens, a lot of people have the emotional response of, you know what, I'm gonna guess it's gonna be okay, I'm gonna try and stick it out. People tell themselves that everything's gonna be okay without needing to go into lockdown, even as the facts of the situation and everything we know about how viral infection spreads tells us that now is the time to minimize contact with other people. If I get corona, I get corona. At the end of the day, I'm not gonna let it stop me from partying. It turns out the behavior of many World of Warcraft players during the corrupted blood plague wasn't what some people would have called rational. While you had people trying to help, staying out of the cities, curing people, you also had looky-loos, people who flocked to the major cities because they just had to see it for themselves. Remember, this was way back in 2005, in the olden days before Twitch and YouTube live streaming. The only way to believe it was to go there and see it for yourself, and now, whoops, you're infected too. Then you had yourself the griefers, the people who had intentionally spread the plague and try to use it to kill low-level players. Obviously, how people behave in a video game isn't going to be representative of how they behave in real life, right? I mean, nobody would go into public intentionally coughing on people's food to try and make them sick, right? Ugh. Humanity's the worst sometimes. The upshot of all of this is that even though we think people behave more recklessly in a video game than in real life, our assumptions might not be as far off as we think. And games might have more to contribute to epidemiological models than we realize. Luckily, we might not be the only ones starting to realize this either. Last month, an article came out that prominent infectious disease epidemiologist and World of Warcraft player Dr. Eric Lofgren is revisiting the parallels between Vanilla WoW's corrupted blood and our current global 
outbreak. He works at the University of Washington, in one of the hardest hit states in the US for this epidemic, and he's spoken out about how his time playing WoW has influenced his work in epidemiology. Quote from him, For me, it was a good illustration of how important it is to understand people's behaviors, when people react to public health emergencies, and how those reactions really shape the course of things. We often view epidemics as these things that sort of happen to people. There's a virus and it's doing things, but really it's a virus that's spreading between people, and how people interact and behave and comply with authority figures, or don't, those are all very important things." End quote. He's among those who've been suggesting that Blizzard should actually bring back the corrupted blood virus in order to better understand its spread and how players behave in the midst of a pandemic. With attention now coming from major news outlets suggesting that WoW could be a valuable research tool, you never know what might be coming down the WoW patch pipeline and the role gamers might have to play in understanding and beating the biggest viruses of our lifetime. So the message today is this, know that the games you're playing are bigger than you. And man, if Corrupted Blood comes back in vanilla WoW, get ready to sign up for whatever free trial Blizzard has going on right now, not just because it's fun to play a game, but because it'll be important for science. It'll be important for learning how to prevent these sorts of global health disasters in the future. And heck, because grinding to become a level 60 night elf hunter is a nice break from grinding tens of thousands of bells to pay off a raccoon landlord. But hey, that's just a theory. A game theory. Thanks for watching.